Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Moore. I'm executive director of Texas Community College Teachers Association. Uh, we have with us today Essie Childers, former past pre or past president of TCCTA, uh, to talk with us uh, about uh, a really engaging topic that I know that a lot of our members are dealing with right now. Before we get started, let me just uh, let you know that TCCTA is hosting a series of online uh, uh, web programs this summer and into the fall. We'll be covering all sorts of major issues that affect our members. So please be sure and join us for those conversations. You can go to our Facebook page actually and, and uh, find out what the topics will be and submit your questions if you have any feedback or things you wanna make sure we talk about when those programs uh, go live. <clears throat> you can also go to our, to our YouTube channel, um, the TCCTA YouTube channel to find the recordings of, of past events. But today we'll be talking with uh, Essie Childers about issues involving uh, systemic racism and how these issues play out on a community college campus. Uh, what does it look like in our academic programs? How can our colleges promote a healthier approach to racial justice? How can we guide our classrooms in discussions of racial justice? We've been getting a lot of questions from them, from members about how they can uh, help lead their students through a conversation on these issues. Uh, we want this to be an ongoing discussion, not just a one-time event that we do during the summer. So uh, please visit the TCCTA website. If you go to tccta.org slash teaching hyphen inclusion, or just go to the main page and you can find it there. Uh, and also our blog and our Facebook page uh, to join the discussion. The uh, page on our website is, is sort of a living document where we're adding more and more resources to it. So if you're looking for ideas and resources that you can use in your classroom, that's a great place to uh, collect some good ideas. The material that came from that page came mostly from our foundation board. The, the members of our board uh, uh, sent in material that they'd like for us to share. And that's what really uh, has guided a lot of our thinking um, on this issue. Uh, TCCTA, uh, uh, SE Childers is a longtime leader in TCCTA, having served on numerous committees, including our executive committee. And as president of TCCTA in 2015, 2016, She's currently on the board of our foundation and helped lead a discussion we've been having on systemic racism and the role TCCTA can play in helping our members address these issues at our institutions. Essie teaches the Learning Frameworks course, EDUC 1300 and Integrated Reading and Writing at Blinn College in Bryan. She serves as senior fellow for the first Blinn College Future Works Academy. Essie, thanks for joining us today. It's good to see you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for inviting me today. Absolutely, I've so been looking forward to this conversation. You and I were talking the other day uh, in kind of preparation for our uh, conversation today about how this, how this issue of uh, systemic racism is really talking about groups. It's not just individuals, but systems, organizations, colleges uh, that need to change. How do we talk about this, about uh, racial injustice, racism on community college campuses? Well, first of all, thank you for asking that question and thank you for having uh, this format. Uh, we're at a point in life and a point in history that racism cannot be ignored. It cannot be just uh, uh, under the covers anymore. And in light of what has been happening in uh, in America, in light of what's been happening in all across the United States, we need uh, to not ignore this issue. And I'm going to be writing an article and I wrote down four things, four buttons. We need to pause. We need to hit the reset button. We need to reflect and we need to refresh moving forward uh, to this um, upcoming fall. Uh, COVID-19 gave us an opportunity to pause because we're all thrust into a state of isolation. But when we, we, we're in the process of preparing to come back to school, so we cannot have business as usual. We need to address the issue of, uh, as you mentioned, racism within groups, because we have community college students and university students coming, and some of them probably have participated in 
a little uh, sit-in, or they probably have been uh, participating in a rally or a march. And so those feelings are all, they're, they're still inside and they we need to provide an avenue for communication. And it's gonna be hard, Richard, it's gonna be hard because this is not usual for us. We're so used to doing business as usual. We're trying to uh, do our syllabus and many of the faculty are trying to learn new formats new video conferencing formats. They're trying to um, learn new courses in a different format. And they're trying to, um, we had the, um, what I call crisis remote teaching. And now the crisis remote teaching has left. Many of the faculty, full-time and adjuncts, they are thrust into a new learning environment. So, but we still need to address this issue of race. So when we come back to our campuses, what are we going to do? I think that first of all, we need to start with the face. Uh, community college educators, we are the face of the college. So what, what avenues are provided for us in order to visit? Now, I know someone will say, well, we, we set up some diversity committees, set up a diversity council. That is all well and good, Richard. That is all well and good. So we can sit around the table and talk about racism, everything like that. But we need to do something. It's beautiful to put things down on paper and uh, we get to the point that there's no budget to do anything, but there are some small things that we can do uh, other than just create a diversity committee. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with the diversity committee. I, I'm all, uh, I volunteer to serve on any committee that Blinn College asked for me to serve on. Uh, but at the end of the day, what are we going to do to make a difference? Mm -hmm. What does this look like when you're talking with your students? Um, we, we have our TCCTA meetups, our master teacher seminars for, uh, for our members. And I know that that has been a, a, a major uh, topic in those discussions, and they're saying that their students are wanting to address these issues. What is, what are you seeing in in your conversations with and among students? Well, um, first of all, many professors will say, "Well, we have our student learning outcomes to cover. Uh, this is not a race one hundred and one class." You're absolutely right; it is not. But I would like to suggest some small things that you can do in order to create a warm, inclusive environment face-to-face -face and or online. If you're in a face-to-face, uh, if you're in a face-to-face -face setting, uh, you need to make sure you abandon the self-fulfilled self prophecy. Mm. Restate that. Abandon the self-fulfilling prophecy. And I need to clarify what that is because many faculty have fallen into that category. The self-fulfilling prophecy, you've already made up your mind because of a person's ethnicity that that person will not succeed in your class, that person can't write, that person cannot understand, that person will not be able to handle your biology class because of that person's race or ethnicity or because of the way the person look or because of the way the person dress. You've already You've already made that determination. And as a result, when the time comes, you may, you may tend to not give that person some extra attention or answer questions fully. You've already written the person off before the person has even you know, taken the first exam. So we need to uh, blot out those ideas that we have just because of a person's race. A second thing we can do, when we move into the online environment, we can take time in order to uh, send out clear, consistent messages. And the things that we're doing in order to create a warm, inclusive environment, it will help all students, not just students of color, but it will help all students. And we have to understand, uh, it may seem so clear to you, and it may seem so clear to me, because we've been teaching for several years, but you have to actually spell things out. And if you see some students not quite understanding, take out the extra time and give them a little nudge along the way, or just take out the extra time to say, 
Is everything okay? What's happening out there? So we need to show some compassion and also flexibility as we move forward to the online environment. And you don't have to point in on feedback. I was doing a um, article just about this a couple of weeks ago. Be careful of your feedback. And what I mean by feedback, when you're making little comments on students' paper, don't say, oh, I'm so surprised you write this well. The message that the students receive is that, oh, because I'm Black, oh, because I'm Hispanic, oh, because I'm Asian, I, you don't expect me to write well? And don't say, why did you use the word hence? You could have used furthermore or however, but hence is a transitional word. Are you trying to say that I don't know how to use transitional words or I plagiarize? So there are other ways that you can write non-biased feedback. And just, I, th I think what I'm hearing is the focusing on their comfort level um, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take away from the discipline and the content of your course. It actually contributes to that because if you can address those issues, then the students are going to be more engaged. And also, Richard, I want to, uh, what I do in my classes, before you even get to that point, you have to know your students. So the very first week, what are you going to do? And I have to find out about your students, whether they're face-to-face -face or online. And uh, I've created an academic autobiography where I have guided questions for the students to answer in each paragraph. And from that, I learn a lot about my students and I can identify the students that might need a little extra help. And we're having a lot of first generation college students mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. college students that are first time in college. Those students, uh, and then you may have some students that uh, are coming with some extra uh, accommodations they tell me all those things through the uh, academic autobiography. So you really get to know your students, their backgrounds, what, what they're bringing with them to the classroom. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Um, also, I could see that just by taking these small measures, you're really communicating with the students uh, about your core values uh, about equality and justice in your classroom and at that institution. Um, it doesn't take much to signal these are things that matter to us and it, it can go a long way toward helping a student feel like they belong in your classroom. It's all about a sense of belonging and research show, there's an article that I read uh, just the other day, research show when I feel like I belong my, uh, I will come to class, I will log on, I will participate in class discussions. And what, what happens at the end of the day? Retention, the retention rates go up mm -hmm. and also the grades go up because they have a sense of belonging. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. We have a question uh, that's come in on the YouTube channel. Um, Janine says, I teach speech communication and I want students to learn to effectively discuss topics like race. I feel my students of color are hesitant to share, even though I reassure them. How can I overcome this? Well, you have to, first of all, start with small steps. And I'm also writing, uh, doing a presentation on uh, resurrecting discussions forums, Resur resurrecting discussion forums, because discussion forums are a vital part and necessary in an online environment. So I would say start with a discussion forum. And in a discussion forum, most times students are asked to just say, who am I? Uh, what's high school that I graduate from? What is my major? So uh, liven it up a little bit. Have them, uh, if they are comfortable, they can post a picture of themselves or they can post a symbol that represents them and they can share a little bit about their culture. So I call this my cultural post. Mm. So you build and, and you have to put some skin in the game. The first two weeks, the first two weeks, I'm very, very busy because I'm responding. I'm trying to make those meaningful connections. And I see something in the post and I say, oh, I really did like that. I like that TV show also. Oh, I've been to Africa. And I, I understand what you mean. I've been there. I've already made a connection with that student from Africa because mm. I 
to Africa. And then if a student talk about, oh, I love how to zip line. I zip line, I made that connection. I try to find something that I can make that connection to. Well, we're calling this session uh, Courageous Conversations. And I didn't know that you'd zip lined before, but that takes some courage right there. <laughs> yes, it does. And it's only because my husband asked for me to do that. And I did not tell him I was scared to death. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to go again. But that was his birthday present. He chose. He chose what he wanted to do. He wanted to zip line in Hawaii. Well, that's uh, that. I think facing your fears is uh, uh, is is part of what we're talking about today. And if these conversations make people a little uncomfortable, maybe just acknowledging that with your students and saying, "I'm figuring this out too. Let's do this together," uh, could be a good way to start the conversation. Well, Richard, you hit upon something very important that I want to uh, kind of tag along. Um, let students know that what you don't know. Master Teacher Meetup, thank you for that. I, be, I have been so enjoying that because we need an outlet as well. And the Master, master Teacher uh, Meetup, one colleague said, I don't know where to start. I'm not racist. No one's, no one, no one is racist. No one, but it's the little things that we do and the little things we say that are called microaggressions that may give us a moment to pause and stop and reflect. What can I do better? And so if you start with a small discussion, and, and I know many of you are maybe teaching 150 students out there. I've taught 150 students as well. But those first two weeks, and I know if you're listening out there, those first two weeks are so, so important. You've got to make the connection. If you want the telephone number, you need to get it the first week because mm -hmm. after that, you won't get it. Well, and I, I, I have found with the uh, TCCTA meetups that we're doing, uh, these are teachers talking with teachers and that's, that's all it is uh, and it's real conversation. And I think you know when you're in a genuine conversation or when you're in uh, kind of a stilted uh, unnatural conversation and creating that environment where people can open up and share and uh, it, it starts with the teacher in the classroom saying, I really want, want to have this conversation um, and being honest. So then the students know, okay, that's what this is. Uh, this isn't just a formality. So well, I'll, be, I'll, be sharing, I'll be sharing the culture post. And another comment I wanted to make is that I started creating Monday motivational videos. I'm thinking of all the things I can do in order to engage my students. So my Monday motivational videos, I share some humanness of me. I want them to know that I'm not just a robot. I have a life just like you. You know, I can do fun things. I'm just not gonna be a stick in front of the camera. And the Monday mot motivational videos, they're less than three minutes. I have five slides. I uh, have a little music at the very beginning to kind of get them pumped up a little bit. And, uh, and a student said, well, I know that sound. I know that, that, that theme song. I, I watched that also. And it was the, uh, the uh, theme song to Greenleaf. And so I'm trying to connect with students, get their attention, show them a little, show them a motivation quote. And then the next slide, here's the week. Here's what we're gonna do this week to kind of get them to whet their appetite. And I always have my contact information and a short video. Motivational video, kind of get them going. That's fantastic. And you really, you really set the, the tone with your students when you, when you do that. Um, you mentioned earlier about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the, how these issues uh, kind of manifest themselves on a college campus. Beyond the classroom, uh, issues of racism and racial inequality and injustice can happen at a college. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, diversity committees, uh, whether they're genuine, there's genuine work being done that's transforming the life of the institution, or if it's just a, a box somebody feels they need to check. Talk a little bit about that. What's the difference between the kind of doing it in a pro forma way versus getting in there and really trying to affect change? For one thing, Richard, uh, when you get a group of students together, number one, 
Uh, you make them feel comfortable because you hear, you hear what they're saying. You hear what they're saying. Many times, uh, like a person said, they are hesitant to, to speak up and share. They're mm -hmm. hesitant to speak up and share, number one, because they don't want to be singled out. And they don't want to be singled out as being a troublemaker. And let's face it, we faculty, we talk amongst each other. Watch out for so-and-so. Is he in your class? You know, watch out for him. So we, we need to be honest. We need to, we need to be honest. And so when you have these committees or when you have these uh, student group forums, you give them an opportunity to share their feelings. And there are other people in the audience, other faculty in the audience to say, well, how do you suggest we go by handling this? What, what can we do differently? And it may be some things that we can do and maybe some things that we cannot do. It, de it depends on what the situation is. But I think providing a platform for them to voice their opinion and actually see things change. Do mm -hmm. show, do something to show that you care. That seems really important. So it's not just we got together, had a meeting and talked, <clears throat> but you really are organizing it around what can we do? How can we change the situation? Um, that's, a, that's a different level. Than, than just, well, we, we had a meeting and talked about it. Well, because we do that all the time. And many times uh, students think that that's all, that's all we're going to do. Uh, we're just gonna have a meeting and check things off. But the fact of the matter is in all community colleges, in all universities, there is something that we can do just a little bit better to have a more welcoming environment for not only faculty of color, but also students of color. There's something, there's something we can do a little bit better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and one thing I do want, I do want to state because this is kind of like a pet peeve of mine. Uh, we are getting a lot of international students coming in and we have advisors that doing such a great job. They're just overworked and overloaded, but we have to really do a better good job in advising students. I had one student in my class She's taken 17 hours, first generation college student. English is not her first language, of course. And on top of that, she was working and she's trying to get to the next university. She's not going to experience success. So we have to encourage her not to take 17 hours. You are not going to experience success. You have four things, four barriers that you need help with. And we have, uh, and I don't have any answers. I'm, I'm not a race expert just because I'm black. I'm in the stream with you. Uh, just like uh, Miss uh, Luella Tate said, we're not, we're not in the same boat together because everybody's boat looks a little differently, but we're all in the stream together. I'm searching and trying to find new ways I can connect with my uh, students of color and how I can connect with uh, my colleagues to make them feel welcome because many times we can have racism against people in our own in our own group. Mm -hmm. It's not always just against black and white or blacks against Hispanics or white against Hispanics. It can be black against black. Mm -hmm. So the conversation is where you can really get to the to the Thing that needs to be done not exactly. that any, one of us has all the answers exactly but we're i'm i'm learning and i'm researching and i'm reading uh reading some things in order to help me become a better professor even if i i mean i've taught for over 30 years and i'm still learning still learning mm -hmm. now how does this look that i mean they're, they're the conversations that we need to be having on campus with students what about colleague to colleague conversations between faculty, uh, between the faculty and the administration um, in the way we run the college. Uh, that, I mean, that, that's a dimension of this, which is, uh, it's, it's important for how we do our work. It certainly it, uh, uh, communicates things to the students um, and to our communities. Um, what do you see there as issues we need to, to be dealing with? Well, first of all, I want, uh, with colleagues, I think that we all need to uh, we all need to make sure that if we are offended, 
And I would, I would, I would not be honest with you or with myself if I have not experienced signs of racism and the systems that I've taught in. But we need to be honest and say, oh, I'm so sorry, you offended me. I would appreciate if you would not say that, you offended me. But do it in a very professional manner. I think that we need to say something rather than not. There have been some times where I did not say something, Richard, and I thought I should have said something because as a spiritual person, my Bible teaches me if someone has offended you, you need to point it out. And uh, you need to make sure that they know how you feel. We, we, we can work together just fine, but you need to understand that those though that's not funny to me. That offends hmm. me. And I think that if you need to start there being open and honest, open and honest. It's, uh, that's, that goes to the heart of so much of what this is about, I think, because uh, there's a reason people don't want to say that they're offended because the, the conversation really hasn't been permitted in a lot of contexts and it does take great courage to step up and do that. <clears throat> and, and so it does take courage for that person. How do we build an environment though where it's not that scary to say, hey, we need to talk about this? Well, first, uh, I'm glad that you asked that because it's very simple. It doesn't cost a penny to say please and thank you and to smile. Mm -hmm. Please, thank you, and smile. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, cost a penny to say, I know that you are real good at Excel spreadsheets. Uh, do you have time to help me? I'm not afraid to ask for help. And I have so many friends that I can ask for help that they will say, well, let me get back with you or let me show you how to do this. So you are collaborating. You're building mutual independent, uh, interdependent relationships. So that big, that's where interdependence, we teach our children about that all the time. But yet as adults, we tend to stray away from that. You can help me, I can help you, and we can work together and we can meet our goal. So why should I you know, just beat myself up against my head when I've got a colleague, it doesn't make any difference what color he or she is that can help me along the journey. So it, it starts with saying, please, thank you, and smiling and collaborating on ideas. And that, if you're, if you're creating a team early on, then when it comes to the difficult issues like race um, or gender or other issues, um, if people have already begun seeing themselves as collaborators and partners and part of a team, it's, it, it seems like it will be easier to deal with the hard issues by starting with, can you help me with, my, with an Excel spreadsheet uh, to, to build the relationship? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as far as the administrators, we need to send a message uh, to the administrators that, you know, I think that we need to be more representative of the community that we serve. Uh, we need to be more representative of the students that we expect to attract and make a make an effort. If, you, if there is a lacking of a diversity officer, don't wait until something happens. You know, start thinking about start planning and making room in the budget for a diversity officer because a diversity officer will make sure that uh, that you go and seek out persons of color. I remember I was growing up uh, and I am a product of integration. I'm a product of integration. And there's been a lot of talk about trying to do away with the history, Richard. And I thought about that on one of my walks uh, I thought about the times when they bombed the buses in Longview, Texas, and this is public knowledge. You can research that in the newspaper. They didn't want the little black kids going to the white school. And so they thought they bombed the buses that will solve the problem. Of course, it did not. I decided to go a year or two early before we had to go to the white school. And so that meant getting up at before seven o'clock in the morning, catch a ride with my dad, who was a truck driver. He's deceased now and dropped me off at the school at 7.15. And I waited until eight o'clock outside the hall 
for school to get started because I thought if they're going to make us go, I'm just going to go two years earlier because I wanted to have commas behind my name. And I share this and, it's, and what that meant was that in the yearbook, you have one page where your picture is on, page 69, for example. But if the commas would mean you have other pages with your name. I wanted, I wanted some more commas behind my name. I wanted to go in and get involved to show them that I could be just as successful as they were. And that real well, and Etsy, this that sounds like the essay I've always known that you're gonna you're gonna step up and 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 start controlling the situation and not just react to the situation. You're gonna well, you're gonna get proactively involved. I, and we all need to do that. We just can't be uh, we just can't be bystanders and uh, and try to make changes from the stadium. Um, we do need we do need in some community colleges we do need more persons of color but when you get those persons of color you need to make sure that you um, if they are qualified obviously they would be if you hire them uh, if you put them in charge of um, a project or something like that give them the opportunity to exercise their power don't just put them in there to be a placeholder to say, oh, this is a check mark. We fulfill that quota. We have a certain percentage of persons of color. But if you're going to give them a response, let them, let, them, let them shine. A good leader, a good leader, and I got this from Colin Powell, um, Secrets of Leadership. A good leader will stand back and let those that he is under supervision shine a good leader knows how to delegate mm -hmm. well, let's talk about that a little bit what does leadership development look like at a community college when one of the values of that college is diversity and inclusion oh what does leadership look back look like when you have uh, a really inclusive diverse body the leader uh, everybody everybody want to go to the party Everybody will want to be a part of the party. It's kind of like cheers. You can't wait to get to work because you know something productive will happen. And, and guess, who, guess who wins? The students. The students win because they know that everybody's working together for a common goal. Mm -hmm. you, you, you just can't, you just can't. Uh, and, and the beauty of that, you get more work done, Richard. You get more work done. And the, your students are seeing the not just the values listed in some document, they're seeing it lived in the life of the institution, the way the faculty interact with each other, <clears throat> the way the administration is run, who has which kind of role. Um, they, they're seeing it actually happen and not just talked about. Right, and, and that's, that's, what, that's been the problem so many times you get, you get uh, and another uh, problem sometimes you have uh, you have people uh, many times racism has been given a bad name because usually when you talk about racism you hear about riots and killings and shootings and a lot of things that happen but uh, that's why we need to educate our students parents we need to educate our children so they will ex they will know exactly uh, what racism when you go to the when you go to the classroom I always tell my students I always tell my students I get them together in groups I will be doing this in an online setting as well and I say let's go to groups and let's come up with 10 things 10 things that you all have in common you can't say we're all freshmen and you cannot say we're all taking this class because nine times out of ten everyone's gonna be a freshman and everyone's gonna be in, everyone's gonna be in the class come up with 10 things at one time, I had them to come up with 25. I thought that was too many. So after they came up with those 10 things, and I said, what have you found out? We are more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. And your students intuitively grasp that, I'm, I'm sure. They, you feel it. You're, you're connected. Yeah, you, you feel it. And... And once you get to uh, mix and mingle, you find someone that's better in math than, than you are. And you, 
you make those relationships. And I always have my students to visualize, visualize five or 10 years down the road. And you can look at each other. You may be working for that person. You might, you might be working on the same job with that person. You don't know who your boss may be. It is very, very crucial for us to have them to be able to work uh, in teams and collaborate for critical thinking, communication, problem solving, because we're, this is what they have to do in a global society. We have to get them ready. They, they're not gonna be in a little cubicle all by themselves. Well, I should, I should, I should back up a little bit. If, if we don't get a hand of COVID, then we might all be, <laughs> they all be. <laughs> they look cubicle by ourselves, but we, we, um, you can do more when you have a team. Iron sharpens iron. So, and you're not, sometimes you're not going to get a chance to pick who's going to be on your team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have, we all have to figure out how we can work together for progress to move forward. And I know I'm thinking one of the ways you can develop that at a, at a college uh, is something that I know you and I've been talking about for years and years, which is about mentorships. Um, can you talk a little bit about mentorships, how they work, how to get those right? I know that our schools are always looking around for good ideas, things that are happening maybe at another institution that they could borrow from. What have you seen that really make for strong mentorships to develop uh, a diverse leadership at a community college? Well, I had an opportunity to uh, participate in a small mentorship uh, because of a, a of a stipend I won with the College Reading and Learning Association. And what I found working with those students, connecting with those students at least once every two weeks, emailing the students, making phone calls with the students, asking them how they're doing. These students were underprepared. They were taking an NCBO non-course uh, based option coupled with English 1301. And, you know, talk about goal setting and vision planning and time management and study skills, that extra little nudge uh, really gave them an opportunity to say, oh, that she, she really cares that she wants me to succeed in both my classes. And the four students that I mentored, I had five, but I think one, uh, one had to drop out for reasons I know. But the four students really did uh, succeed and finish both their classes. Uh, and just talking about, uh, talking about your grades openly with a person that's a, a mentor would be non-judgmental. Just talking about ways that you can uh, improve things that you should do. Uh, just a little simple time management and study habits, creating a schedule, a chart, some things that they have not done or thought of and some little small changes they can make to experience success. And, and one thing, Richard, a lot of these kids are coming to college for the first time FTIC, first time in college, they're away from home. And some of them are experiencing loneliness and they don't always have time to talk with the teacher because the teacher has 25 other students and they're rushing to classes. And sometimes they just need someone to listen. And making it about things that are relevant. So the student feels like, hey, I'm getting something out of this. I, I need to, to learn how to I need to learn how to be a college student um, and making it about the relationship, it sounds like. Right, and I, I, I have students that I have worked with that are not even in my class that uh, come and ask, say, yo, you'd be so proud of me. They were in my class, you'd be so proud of me. I'm actually making a schedule. I'm actually having a notebook for each class and I'm checking my assignments off. They just wanted to come and show me that, you know, that they're doing what they need to do it's going to be a better semester. I'm back on track. I love to hear those success stories. Now, I, I want to uh, get back to the student part, but while we're on the mentoring, before I forget, I, I want to ask about what does that look like? You mentioned earlier about bringing in uh, a diverse faculty in, in the hiring process, making sure that's a part of the consideration. Um, how, how do you develop mentorships to develop those new faculty to be faculty leaders to be in positions of administration wherever they wind up how do you how do you cultivate leadership among uh new faculty coming in 
Well, uh, we are all, uh, when we have new adjuncts come in, we are, the those of us that are seasoned, let me use the word seasoned, uh, we are asked to team up with them in order to help them and shepherd them uh, with any questions that they have. And we go in and also observe them, make suggestions and things of that nature. There's a whole checklist of things that we do in order to help them feel more comfortable and they can ask us questions and we can help them with their uh, assignments and things of that nature. And we kind of, uh, and they can e email us and ask questions. So we kind of help them along. But as far as leadership, we have uh, the faculty fellows at Bland College. And I was one of the first graduates of the uh, faculty fellows. And basically is a leadership training uh, program for those that want to move forward in uh, leadership abilities at the college. I think it's just so, so wonderful. I don't know if you're, uh, uh, Joyce Lagenerger, uh, she is the developer and also she works with that uh, program they may be in their sixth or seventh year now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful. And we also uh, have uh, a little leadership retreat. We're asked to read a book on leadership and we get a chance to understand the systems of the organization. And I think that's a great way in our, and, and the beauty about this is not only faculty, but it's also staff. So you get a chance to know uh, staff members and, and I think that's the beauty because it takes uh, a village in order to have a successful college, as we all know. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing three things in that. One is the one-on-one -on -one connection. that You've got a person you can go to uh, to ask questions and make sure you're, you're connecting with them. It's providing them with information on leadership. Um, and then it's the networking part of it. Uh, I mean, those sound like three really strong ingredients for cultivating leaders. Um, and, also, we, and, all, and also, Richard, you know that, uh, of course, we're a strong supporter of TCCTA and their, uh, uh, or, uh, the organization, the workshops in professional development. And we have a tremendous amount of opportunities to do professional development uh, in-house and also external when the opportunities come to do, uh, we are strongly encouraged to participate in, uh, to, for growth and improvement. And I think that's wonderful when you have an organization that fully supports uh, professional development. Well, and two years ago, TCCTA created our faculty fellows program for faculty in their first five years at their institution uh, to yes. do this kind of work. And so uh, those of you who are watching, uh, if you're in your first five years uh, of teaching, or if you have a colleague who is, who you think um, is uh, um, uh, someone interested in leadership, uh, you might propose them for this year's class. We're, we're recruiting uh, this year's class right now. So, uh, and, uh, it, and is it two per campus or three? Uh, two per campus, yes. Two per campus. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we've got a few questions here. One is, uh, my college does not have a diversity officer. Do you have suggestions for me to propose the establishment of such a position to my administration? How do you bring, how do you bring that up? I certainly, I certainly, uh, I certainly wish that I could have some suggestions for you, but uh, to my knowledge, and I stand corrected, to my knowledge, we need a diversity officer at, at our college as well. Mm -hmm. and so, and so, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, diversity officer can. Uh, I don't want to say. Um, well, I guess I can say it. I look, sometimes I look upon a diversity officer as a firefighter. They put fires out before they spread. Huh. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, they have, uh, they, they are very, uh, they're good listeners. They have uh, knowledge of legal matters. And when you get a community college of a certain size, I think that you need to start thinking about, you know, looking at maybe having I said diversity officer, there may be other names for the title, but someone needs to, someone needs to keep a pulse on the climate of race there and also making sure everyone has a voice, everyone is heard, making sure there are programs that uh, are multicultural programs and speakers of that nature. 
that's all important because students like to go where they can see people look like them. I, I like the idea of the firefighter because the, the fires that don't happen are often uh, just not, it's not appreciated the problems that we don't have. Um, but if you can catch them early, it, there's tremendous value in that. Yes, yes. And, uh, and un un unfortunately, it brings to, uh, it brings to mind, uh, we don't want, we don't want to be involved in any lawsuits or anything of that nature. Uh, our main objective is to make sure all students that come to our community colleges experience success on their journey, uh, whether it's success in career, in their career, achieving a certificate or a graduate uh, uh, AA degree, whatever it may be, that is really our focus. Mm -hmm. That is our focus. So anything that uh, takes us away from our focus, then you know we we tend to uh, start having hiccups along the way. It slows us up along the way. That's why it, it's important to have a warm, inclusive environment for everyone, for everyone, because that's where success will flourish. You know, the community colleges, when we have these young minds that come to us, um, and Richard, you're supposed to uh, do your research. The guest speaker we had at TCCTA, I'll never forget his comment. Uh, and he stated something to the nature that we are the, um, the guardians. We are the guardians uh, when those uh, students, community colleges are guardians of the culture. Uh, we create citizens uh, in our democracy. And so they are coming and they will be experiencing new things. And so many times these students come to us, they're just like clay. They're just like clay. And so we have shape and mold their lives. And we have to make sure we do a very good job of that. And I think a, a diversity officer can help with that because they really are a valuable resource because they help us with our blind spots. Questions that the college just didn't think to ask uh, as soon as it comes up. It, it's, of course we needed to ask that, um, but you needed someone with, with the perspective that's gonna make sure that that becomes part of the thinking. Well, I, I, I never, uh, and it's just little, it's just like things that we should not, we should not be afraid to speak up for fear of retaliation. Uh, I think that uh, some faculty members, sometimes uh, I'm thinking about other, another environment, but I'll never, one professor uh, did, uh, had mentioned to me, um, and I, and I, and I, that's where that's microaggressions come in they don't really mean it. They don't really mean it, but I hear something differently. And I'll never forget, I'm not the first black president of TCCTA. I'm so happy I had other uh, men and women to pave the way for me, but my mentors were white. My mentors were white. And they're the ones that said that we want you to think about, you know, running for treasurer. But then once I became treasurer, I thought, you know, I love these people. You know, I, I received so much energy and they just helped me to develop my, uh, my passion for serving others. I want to hang around a little bit longer so I continue to run. But I think I was vice president at that time and I had uh, someone to say, well, I did not realize you were so high up in TCCTA. Now, was that a compliment? Perhaps. But I took it differently. I took it to the point, well, uh, you're black and you're going to be president of TCCTA? That's the way it came across to me. But perhaps, perhaps it was to be a compliment. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> and it, uh, I, I hope that it doesn't reflect on TCCTA that, that that would be anything out of the ordinary. Uh, we, but I, I, I hear your, I hear what you're saying, and we need to be aware of how our words are are perceive, perceived, whether they're intended that way or not. We In, intended or not, and so I, I think that we're all in, we're all given an opportunity to pause, hit the reset button, mm -hmm. and reflect, mm -hmm. and reflect, and I. Uh, and Oprah Winfrey, 
I hate to repeat what she said, but it's true. When you know better, you do better. So we're, we're called as a nation to do better. Well, I think TCCTA is better because you ran for office. Essie, I'm so glad that you did. That's, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Richard. It was a tremendous uh, pleasure. And I do encourage anyone that I want to uh, serve to just do that. I, I have people to encourage and mentor me and tell me exactly what to do. And as a uh, mentee, I listen. So we, we, need to, we need to listen. We need to listen with open ears and not be judgmental. We have a question here. I want to make sure we, we get to our, our questions. Um, one of them is asking about any advice for really embedding these into the curriculum. Uh, you have the canon uh, influences from the Western world. This tends to leave out other perspectives. Uh, do you have advice? Yes. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for that uh, question. When you review your curriculum, just look to see what opportunities you have in order to pull in uh, persons of color, persons of color. Or if you're having students to do a research paper or a short paper, ask them to choose a person that reflects upon their identity. So that comes under uh, the motivational framework um, when you allow students a choice in the way they can do the assignment. And, and nine times out of 10, they will probably choose someone from their culture to give a report about. Mm -hmm. And I teach education learning framework. So there are many opportunities that uh, they can uh, choose. I allow them to choose a motivational video. And nine times out of 10, they may choose a motivational video from a person of color. Uh, it could be Hispanic or a black person that they can relate to that motivates them. And that's why I let them choose. I see, I, I, I know that some of the material on that page that we've uh, created on our website for resources, oh, yeah. uh, you, there are some good resources for embedding these things in the curriculum. Uh, so uh, Haley, you might want to check out that page on under the resources tab on our, on our website. Um, but Essie, I know one of the things that uh, that you mentioned uh, that you included in that collection of resources was helping people walk through the process of becoming aware of these issues of racial injustice. Uh, that people people kind of come to the subject wherever they are, and they they need to go through a process. You don't just start out fully grasping this because it's just such a big issue. Talk a little bit about that in your experience at the at your college, or just in uh, talking with your uh, uh, colleagues around the state. Um, what does that look like for someone to to become, or with your students, uh, for students to become aware um, through a process? You know, not a single conversation. Um, what does that look like to you? Well, uh, if you want to, uh, sometimes you can do uh, case scenarios. And I did, uh, I was doing a presentation in California where I walked through with, a, uh, with several uh, faculty, several faculty uh, presentation. And uh, I used the word token. Uh, and so I referred to myself as being a token black. Obviously that did not resonate with some people. So I had to explain what that tokenism was uh, sometimes we formulate groups and we want to make sure we have a black in the group because that kind of makes her feel good that we're not left out if we put so that token is oh uh, we're just going to go ahead and do this to make you feel good um, I don't want to be assigned a position I don't want to be receiving a uh, an award just because I'm black I want to make sure that they look at me not just for the color of my skin but the content of my character and also the knowledge that I bring to the table. And we have to make sure that uh, we understand that we're all can appreciate one's diversity. Diversity, persons of color is really a, a, a great asset that they bring you know, to our classrooms. 
because of the cultures and also the communities that they come from, we can learn so much from them. So we need to build upon that. How can you learn from me and how can I learn from you? And we have to avoid these uh, bandwagon ideas. All black people like fried chicken? Not so. All black people don't. A great majority eat fried chicken, but so do a lot of white people. So we, we need to stop putting everybody in the same bandwagon. Uh, and then we need to make sure that we don't hee-haw on, on uh, jokes, uh, hee-haw on jokes, because uh, that's, not, that's not professional, number one. And our, the students that we have, if you hear conversations, if you hear conversations in your classroom, you need to be bold enough to step up to say, that is not appropriate, that is not professional. We need to have a respect for one's culture. Uh, it, seems, it seems also that it, it's hard to learn when we don't listen, <laughs> that if we want to really understand these issues, we need to do more listening and bringing people into the conversation is the first step, but then listening is the other part because they've got a point of view that's different uh, and we need to hear it. And also one thing I do want to make sure that I uh, stress, when you have persons of color in positions you need to uh, give them the same value and respect as you would everyone else. Don't just assign them to projects that relate to diversity. Mm -hmm. you assign them to projects that you would normally assign them to and, uh, and they'll just uh, put them in a place. Uh, and this has been brought out in the Black in the Ivory. We talked about that Black in the Ivory, the hashtag Black in the Ivory. And as I was reading this article, it was two colleagues. One was from the University of Texas and uh, the other one, I can't remember where she was from, another university, they were tenured professors and they were just sitting around reflecting and talking about how uh, there was uh, systemic racism. And they thought about that and thought about the opportunities that maybe they were passed over, but they were black put in the tower of significant, so to speak, many ivory up there. They were up there, but yet what's, how much fun is being up there when your hands are tied and you're not able to really, you know, you're not able to really pull your seat to the table. You just kind of push back a little bit. So what, how much fun is that? Or if you, or you, you're getting a project and you're not able to really, someone's going to look over your project and it's a good project and someone else take credit for it. How much fun is that? Well, and, and uh, you had mentioned this to me the other day when we were talking. I, I, I'm on Twitter quite a bit. Uh, I had not seen that hashtag before and I checked it out and I, I would recommend it to, to any listener. It, it, it is eye-opening and, and that black in the ivory, it, it, it's interesting. I think we talked about this a little the other day that, that it, there's sort of a double entendre to it because it's black in the ivory as in the ivory tower, but it also kind of suggests in a white world, the ivory, it, it's a, and it shouldn't, we, it shouldn't be that. And so, uh, but this is talking about what, what issues come up. So I think, yeah, if, if I found it very helpful for me in thinking about what yeah. these issues really look like. And they, re they receive so many, they receive, uh, oh, over 7,000 uh, Twitter comments, but, uh, and it was just of them stopping and reflecting about, uh, yeah, we have a, we have arrived, but we're not quite there yet. We're not quite there yet. It's a lot, it's a lot that we need to uh, do in order to, uh, make sure that we all feel welcome and comfortable and respect it and respect our the knowledge that we bring to the table. And so for students that are, we're going to be in an online environment and we have to make sure we make that online envi environment so warm and welcome and call on everybody. Make sure you make, a, a if you're in a remote setting, I will be in a remote setting, make sure you call on the student. Everybody loves to hear their name. Mm -hmm. I see, I sure, I really value your insights on this. It's been helpful for me to understand these issues. Um, I, I, it does seem like community colleges are a place where we have a real opportunity to make a difference. 
uh, for our students that making the kinds of changes we're discussing today uh, will ripple out from here because our students will go into the world with a much clearer understanding about how we can all live together. Uh, and, and to be in a place like this uh, is, is a privilege that all of us in community colleges can share and embrace. So we just don't, we just don't know. We just don't know. I want to leave. I know we're running out of time here, but I want to make one more comment that you may not think that you can make a difference, but one person can make a difference. One person can make a difference. And we're experiencing, uh, it's not so much about black and white. It's about what is best for the, uh, the student. What is best for the student we, we're going to be experiencing a growth of uh, in community colleges, I hope. Uh, we have non-traditional students coming back. And if we can just respect and understand and appreciate that everybody has value. Everybody has something they can bring to the table. Everybody has a talent. And we just need to work and pull from that talent before we realize it, we're going to have a classroom that you just can't wait, just can't wait to turn the computer on because you know that somebody's gonna want you there. And this is what we want. We want all students to feel welcome. We wanna create a warm, friendly environment for our students in the classroom and also face to face because we want them to experience success along their academic journey. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that word, Essie. Thank you, Richard. And thanks to everyone for being with us today. Uh, Katie will get this up on the uh, 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 TCCTA YouTube page here shortly. So uh, be sure to link to that and share it with your colleagues at your institution. And I hope this prompts a, a much bigger conversation across the state around- Absolutely issues that we really need to be uh, uh, exploring and and make and leading to changes that happen the way uh, we do our work. Visit the TCCTA website. That resource page that I mentioned has a lot of great materials that I think you can apply directly to your classroom, to your programs, uh, to your institution, and join the conversation on our blog and on the Facebook page. Uh, this is a conversation that needs to go on, and I anticipate that it will throughout the rest of the summer, into the fall, and beyond, because uh, we have a lot of work to do on this issue, and I think the best way it's going to happen, and the lasting way it will happen, is if we do it together. So, Essie, thanks so much for your leadership. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Bye-bye.